Hello, everyone. So we'll just start with, uh, by introducing ourselves and then jump right into the conversation. I'm Dr. Roberta Gardner. I'm an associate professor of language and literacy and reading education at Kennesaw State University. Hello. Good afternoon. How are you beautiful people? Um, I'm well. Um, so I am Stephanie Dunn, and I am a writer and filmmaker and professor uh, at Morehouse College um, and the author of a young adult novel out about a year called Snitchers um, and a nonfiction book, uh, Bad Bitches and Sassy Supermamas. It's, it's a series title. <laughs> it's, it's about black cinema. <laughs> So don't get upset. Not cursing. It's the title. I was thinking my mom's in the audience and she's going to say, stop cursing. Nah, it's the title. It's the title. Uh, I'm Regis LeBron, President, Chief Creative Officer of Ubuntu Films and Television Development Company, and um, makers of the movie, writer, producer, and so glad to be here. I'm Jan Spivey Gilchris. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful day. I'm a little choked up for seeing some of my people on the film. I haven't seen them for a long time. So. Yes. I'm, I think I'm done. All right, I'm Sherry Lynn. I'm Regis's wife. I'm an educator, um, wife, mother, grandmother, and uh, a friend of Jan's also. My name is R. Gregory Christie. I'm an award-winning children's book illustrator. Um, I'm local to Atlanta. Um, I've done quite a few children's books and won many awards, but I have to say that I'm grateful for the work you've done because Ashley, Jerry Pinckney, they, they're all a legacy. They, they broke the doors down so that I could do what I do and I'm, I'm honored to be here today. I'm Aminata Umoja. I'm the founder of Quilombo Academic and Cultural Institute. My daughter, Tashia Umoja, who's not here today, Umoja Mkanga, is the director. But I have my family members here, a sister that supports Quilombo and brings us bags of books, and a couple of parents, a couple of children here. And we are honored to be here with you, Dr. Jan. And all of you. Yes. <laughs> so honored. So honored. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gilchrist. We're going to start with this image that um, Regis started with in the documentary um, and the quote, but I do what is true. Uh, Dr. Jan Spivey Gilchrist, you mentioned this in the documentary. Can you say just a little bit more about the kind of truthful work that you produce. And then I would like for the rest of you on this panel to talk about the element of truth in the work that you do as educators, as storytellers, because again, that's what this illuminated, just the beauty of storytelling and particularly black storytelling. Well, I guess I'm a lot older than a lot of people, but I came through when growing up, I never saw anything that was black and positive. They would say um, later, I would get complimented on my work being positive. And that was kind of insulting because what I saw was ugly, which meant it wasn't truth. And so when I look at a child and I see beauty and you say that's a positive image of that child, if you really listen to that sentence, it's implying that the child isn't who I'm looking at, that I'm somehow enhancing the beauty God gave this child. My mother had a baby every year in the house. And my job was to take care of the babies. That was what my, my job was. So I cheated because that wasn't a job. And my brothers and sisters got to clean the house and wash clothes and all those things. And, and the only reason they didn't want the babies is because of the poopy diapers. 
they didn't have cloth di diapers. I mean, they didn't have pa you know, paper diapers, so nobody wanted that job. There was a bit, nothing that would have taken me away from my job. My job was heavenly. And I got a chance to see the babies before their eyes were open. And then when they would open them, we both saw the world. And I just, so when, I, when someone would give me that as a compliment about my people, you know, my, my father who was, you know, worked all the time, every day and all that for 14 children, my mother, you know, who worked also in the house and outside cleaning houses for white people and then coming home and having enough love for us. And then you get to when I wrote the book, Indigo and Moonlight Gold, in 1990, because my mother died. And I couldn't imagine it, because that didn't make any sense to me. My mother was all powerful. There was no such thing as ending my mother. And so I wrote that as a poem, and my publisher asked me to make it into a book, because my, my mom had one lap, just one lap. And at nights, because I was the oldest of 10 in the house, the older ones had gone away. So I was the oldest of 10 and we were stair steps a year apart. So when I got a chance to sit with mama at night after everybody was asleep and just be with her and she was just my mama alone, that was, those were special nights. And um, she was gone and it made no sense, I was crippled. So, what I try to, to remember is how much love it took for her to have all those children, one lap, and still had enough time to make us feel like only ch children. That's so beautiful. That quote gave me chills when you said, when the baby opened their oh. eyes you both saw the world and I feel like that you've done that for the world through your book so oh. I do want to ask some of the other people on the panel to like think about this quote and think about what it means to your work as storytellers to tell particular truths well I'll begin I'm going to move my chair because I can't see Dr. Gilchrist, when she's talking, and I want to be able to see her so I can hear her well. Um, I'm not a storyteller, I'm an institution builder. And right now, in 2023, they are trying to commit genocide on our people by not teaching our history, by not telling our stories, let alone just teaching our children how to read. Most of our children, many, and many of our children, not most, many of our children are far below grade level in public schools. And they're not doing anything about making sure they know how to read. So we had to start our own school because I didn't want my grandchildren to be in that kind of threatening environment. So I rely on people like you to tell the stories. And your pictures tell such beautiful stories. Early in your introduction, Regis, you said you didn't know why you were getting the award with all the other people. There were doctors, but you're a doctor. You're a doctor to our soul. And this movie that you produce feeds our souls. It is critical work. Your pictures, Angela Davis being behind you when you were talking to us, you telling us your truth when you left a husband that was an abuser. Oh man, how many of us don't know women in that position? So I so honor your work and what you've done for our people. And I want my grandchildren to know our truth, which means what you said earlier, we come from, we are the original people. Everybody else comes from us. That is the truth. Thank you. So first, I think you are a storyteller right. because you just told one. Yeah, you did. And, and I would lead with saying that we are all storytellers and we all have stories. Our stories come out in different ways. So my mother, who was one of 16, wow. and was one of the elder um, children, one of the, the two oldest girls, who had to do a lot of what you just said um, at home, and had to pick cotton very early um, when, she was, when she was young, 
I became a storyteller because of the truth and the humanity in my grandmother's and in my auntie's voices. The accent, the sound of them telling stories that they hadn't elevated to any particular art, but were just their stories, to being in the room with my grandmother because the house was crowded and you know some grandchild had to sleep in the room with grandmama. And, um, her telling me things that she didn't normally talk about in the daytime. And so learning things about when she was growing up that she usually didn't talk about, like how the farm got stolen by my grandfather, just things they didn't talk about. I know those are all the things and all the reasons why I'm a writer, why I fell in love with words. It was people like Dr. Dan, it was Patricia McKissick, but McKissick. It was Ernest Gaines. It was Mildred, Mildred Taylor. There's a whole song of people I wish I could name. It was James Baldwin. It was all of these people. Finding books early um, gives us truth, um, helps us to not only escape, but to imagine, um, helps us to become who we are. And so, in some ways, when we talk about you know, what is true, what I know. Uh, is true is that books and words and the storytellers, visual artists, I'm a filmmaker and I'm a writer, um, we help children not just to see themselves but to imagine their future selves. We help them to imagine the world as it should be. Um, we, have, we, we help to teach history. We help to not perpetuate history we shouldn't perpetuate. And I think that is I think, to me, that is the most profound truth that I got from books and from storytellers like Dr. Jan that really shaped me and made me want to tell the truth bravely, as bravely as I could, in my own writing and in my own work. That, that is really the great gift. It's the honesty and it's the, it's the humanness, it's the humanity that's in the art. That's the thing. So well said. I'm going to pick on um, R. Gregory Christie for this one, and, and also, obviously, Dr. Jan Spivey Gilchrist. With regard to painting, this was, a, this was another quote from you, Dr. Jan, about using the strokes of paint fiercely, right, to attack this situation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on you just a little bit, um, R. Gregory, to, to talk a, b a little bit about this because your, your art, which you've given credit to Dr. Um, Gilchrist and you've given credit to Ashley Bryan and, and so many others, can you talk just a little bit about what it means to paint fiercely as a children's illustrator? What's unique about doing children's books is that you're doing artwork for people that are not even born yet. It also becomes generational. And it's the only type of art form that I know of where you, it's very interactive. The child may not even know how to read, and they see visual pictures first. Colors, tangible turning of the pages of a tangible book, that all develops a brain. Beyond that, as an artist, I, when I was a little child, I was obsessed with art. I went to the art store so much they hired me when I got older. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. They said, we know you, you can work here. After that, I worked in a museum. And after that, I worked in, uh, for a newspaper doing spot illustration. And then I jumped and became a freelancer, completely freelancing, doing record covers like Coltrane and Joe Sample, uh, even Jimmy Buffett did little the little illustrations for that. When I first got my job to do children's books, it was a book of poetry written by children called The Palm of My Heart. And I took it as another freelance illustration job. But over the years, doing children's books have become very dear to me because it counterbalances what images children see and society sees. When I was very young, I didn't even know all the great things people of color have done. And the books I tend to do are books that really are um, not well-known people. 
like Bass Reeves, first U.S. Marshal of Color United States. It's become more popular now, but when I did the book, people didn't know. They didn't know all the things Muhammad Ali did. They didn't know Sojourner Truth. Um, just recently, I've done a painting for, of Harriet Tubman, a portrait, and it's in the permanent collection at a museum called the Booth Western Art Museum. I know Harriet Tubman, but with the research, I didn't know that she was someone who led an armed rebellion to free the most amount of ins formerly enslaved people at one time, over 750 people at the Combe River Raid. So you just see these images of these older, you know, an old woman, and they call her Moses, and you know these things, but you don't know those, that, that type of history. You, you celebrate Juneteenth, but you don't know that June 3rd, 1863 is when that raid happened. You would think it would be celebrating that. 750 people freed at one time, and the only time in, in history a woman is armed rebellion, first soldiers to, to, have, to be trained and carry weapons that were formerly slaves. It's a, it's a book in itself. Okay. And I always do books that people say, I didn't know that, why didn't we learn that in school? And that's because I see all that nonsense on TV, I see images, I see people carrying themselves in a crazy way. If you were to just even go and ask your family, tell me a story about my great grandfather. There, there's so much history and richness in your family history. And, and that's what those stories that are even in your own society, your own family, they could be books. We, we, it's just don't let other people tell your story and protect the stories that you have and, and hold yourself up. That and, reminds you know, me of that book you did with Vonda Nelson. What was that one? And, and he was a bookseller. Yes, uh, Louis Michaud. It's called No yes. Crystal Stare was no one No Crystal book, Stare. And yeah. the other's The Book Itch yeah. for, for younger children. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you for that, a good reminder. The books are out there, yes, you come on now. It's right outside with, with Dr. Jan's books. We, you know, we both um, are in the same industry, but we have uh, outside you can get these books and have them signed. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jan. I just Jan. wanted to oh, comment yeah. a little something on what Greg was saying, and it kind of goes back to the, the first question, but <clears throat> there's so much truth that's hidden that you discover when you seek it. And truth is really like light. It, it, it's definitely going to put out darkness. It's going to illuminate something within a person when they find it. Um, and I think that all of our talents of everyone up here is, resi is resonated in that search for truth within ourselves to find out what it is the most high power is really empowering us to do is going to be rooted in your truth. So I just say, if you don't know what it is, keep seeking it. But truth is like light. It will, it will shine. And it will change something and uncover something. And I like to hear those stories where we found something in seeking that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's all right, the connections, which Dr. Jan, um, Ashley Bryan, right? So I met um, Ashley Bryan when I was a librarian, um, and he came, he actually came to Auburn. And for those of you, mo most of the people on this stage know that I'm married to Morris, and Morris um, was, um, sort of manning the Ashley Bryan Children's Book Festival. That was at a time when, when that was um, a program that they held. And I said, oh, well, our school has money. Can we bring him to our school? And I think you said it, Regis. Ashley was art. He embodied art. <clears throat> Dr. Jan, can you talk a little bit about being with Ashley and working with Ashley and just what that was like to create, co-create with him. Uh, marvelous. I mean, he, 
I met him sitting in the hall at HarperCollins 30 years, over 30 years ago. He was just sitting there, um, and I knew who he was, because everybody in the world knew who he was. And I walked in, um, and I walked over to him, and he said, I, I, I know you, you're Ashley Bryan, how you doing? And he, you know, he was the most, I can't, I can't, I can't the humble is not even the word. He had no clue how important he was, although he knew he was important. It's, a, it's something that he used to say to the children. Love yourself, and when you're all filled up, then reach out and love everybody. So it kind of summed up what, what you feel when you need him, because you certainly are not overwhelmed by his, his awesomeness, because he doesn't put that out. But you eventually get it. But every year for 30, over 30 years, I travel to the island. And I don't know if you all know, he lived on an island off the coast of Maine, between Nova Scotia and North um, East Harbor. It was a jump to get to him. But the first time he invited me, I knew I was gonna go back. But I didn't know I was gonna go back every year, July 13th, for his birthday. And one day he told me, if you don't come, I don't get a birthday. That's all, oh. he, that's all he needed to say. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and so it w we called it the, the dollar store birthday because he liked the funny hat. He liked the birthday party. And so all I could do is stop at the dollar store, pick up um, you know, paper hat and some balloons and all that. And my husband, my husband, poor thing, he, he married an artist, so he's been doing crazy stuff ever since that day. And so when I say, I have to go see Ashley on his birthday, um, he, he would drive me from Illinois <laughs> to Maine, and that is amazing. We would go through Canada sometimes, any way to get there, because sometimes things just didn't allow for it. And then we get on a plane sometimes, but every July 13th, we were there for his birthday mm -hmm. for those years. And sometimes Ashley and I were someplace else. And so we had to go to the island to celebrate his birthday because he wanted to be there for everybody else. He didn't want to, the people were gonna come for his birthday, so he wanted to get back there. Um, but working with him was amazing for me because he never left the island that he didn't make a telephone call to me and say, I'm getting ready to leave. And then he would call me back to say, he's coming back. And it always reminded me of that <coughs> of song, um, His Eyes on the Sparrow. Because I'm thinking, how does he, everybody in the world loves Ashley. Everybody in the world knows Ashley. Why does he care about me? Why does he care if I know he's leaving the island? I always felt like it just made no sense. But that's how, if you talk to somebody else, they felt the same way. That's just who he was. And uh, I remember, I mean, there were some really funny times. We were in Chicago. We, we all met in Chicago, and we were going to Wisconsin, to the museum, that new museum that flies on the museum. But anyway, at the time, it was new. And when we got there, it was bus, buses of people. And Ashley gave you everything, all of them. Any part of him, you were welcome to it. So we go to this museum and it's three bus loads of people. And when it was time to eat, there were all these um, lunches, lunch bags, just piled up on this table. So Ashley was passing out lunch bags, lunch bags. And this woman came in and she said, what are you guys doing? And we're all eating. And <laughs> those lunches are for the people who brought the lunches. And if you, if you could have taken your food out of your stomach <laughs> and put it back, you, it was the most embarrassing, oh, horrible no. thing. We were eating people to lunch. <laughs> the stories within the story. That's so wonderful, okay. though. Well, that and, 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 and eventually, when, they, when we said, Ashley, <laughs> you, know, we, everybody just, you could blame Ashley him. Gave, we knew they weren't going to kill Ashley. Okay. Right. 
ask the gay people, then they would get all was forgiven. So we had to, you know, come up with money and stuff like that for to replace the food, but no, that was just Ashley. Yeah. Because he would have given it to you, so he assumed you would have given it to him. And that's yeah. how he was. Yeah. That was just a beautiful story, right? That's just a beautiful story. And does anybody else want to add anything just with regard to this amazing work that you co-created, My America? I was really blown away when you showed Regis in the, in the, in the doc, the images, how they seem, yes, seamlessly like synthesized them. It looked like you were on the same wavelength, the two of you. No, I would, I would say that the relationship with Ashley, once I understood it, um, it really started with during the interview process when Jan said, and we did use that clip in the movie, that when her father died, she went and spoke to her husband and said, I need to go see Ashley. And I thought that was incredible because he had to be one of her greatest friends. She definitely, he definitely was a super mentor to her. But he had to have the voice, the voice of God to you in reference to what you were feeling and what you were reasoning with. And I felt that was, you know, someone um, that fortunately I was able to meet during this journey. Um, and he was all that. <laughs> and he was so true to himself, that's what made him beautiful. Um, he loved what he loved, and uh, uh, just a beautiful human being, uh, I have to say. But yet, some of those decisions that were made in terms of how the the uh, the art or all of the art that you know we had a choice to use was selected it was certainly um, divine guidance to put it in that order and mr oh and mr business island our mrs mr island i don't know if you saw the couple they were my mentors when i was a little girl and my folks are all gone, because most of my brother, I had eight sisters, and now I have one. And that's since 98. And my brothers, I had six brothers, and now I have three or two. Three, <laughs> I'm getting up. But Mr. and Mrs. Island had seven children, and they were just like, I kept getting these people that were like Ashley in my life. And my, my mom used to say, these are angels. They don't know they're angels but they are, and I kept getting them, so I know it was true. And it, so at night, when, you know, when I was afraid or anything, my mother gave us angels. So we never could be really afraid because they were there in, with us. And so Mr. and Mrs. Island, Mr. Island will turn 100 in um, January, on January 13th, as a matter of fact. So he will turn 100, she will turn 96. And they have been in my life since I was 14. <laughs> That's beautiful. And so I have to ask um, about the other illustrious person that's on the screen in back of you. Uh, yeah. She had to be. Eloise Greenfield. Yes. Eloise Greenfield. There is a song that's come from Wicked. Um, it's called For Good. Do you know that song? Okay. Do you know that song? I sing it. Oh. <laughs> what? You're not going to sing it? Oh, no, ma'am. Okay. You sing? Oh. The words, just I can't get through it because it breaks my heart every time because it's so like us. I met her when she was world renowned with nobody. And she, it, at that autograph where she was talking about. And she, I, I went to see her, Nora Brooks Blakely, who was Gwendolyn Brooks' daughter, was a good friend of mine. And she said, we're gonna go see Eloise Greenfield. And she was there, so we got together and we went. 
and I went into my studio and I pulled a print of that little girl out and I wanted to give her something. I just, you know how you just want to run up to somebody and say, do you know what you did to my life? Because there was nothing for little, but I had a daughter. There was nothing for little black girls that, you know, nothing like that. Or little black boys, there was nothing. And I wanted her to know, but there were no words that you could just, so I said, maybe if I give her this, this drawing, she will know what I'm feeling. Because I want to hug her. I'm not touching this woman. She might hug. And so she, when I gave her to her, she actually hugged me. And then she, she just loved it. And she talked about it up until, what, this was six years ago? And she always talked about it forever, about getting that gift. That was but, a love language for sure. Everything, I said that was a love language for sure. Oh my gosh, you, she put me, as a matter of fact, I remember when the, we did a book and they put my name on the bottom and she was not happy at all. She, she did not believe in inequality of any sort. She made me dot every I, <laughs> Every comma, I learned so much from her, and I heard, you know, I was degree to the max. I knew what that comma was supposed to be, but she was uh, just meticulous in life and in everything, and I learned so much from her. Um, but also mostly about love, and she loved children to death. I hate that she cannot see their reaction. And I hate that children can't know that she stayed up nights. I mean, she labored over her work for them. And she, she said it's for them. I might go in and say, all children sometime. Eloise Greenfield went in and said, for black children, every time. There was a poem that um, they had to redo the book because they took the word black out. Because she, she loved all children, but she, this, this is for, I wrote this poem. Oh, it was Harriet Tubman didn't take no stuff. Oh, yeah. So I could think of Eloise Greenfield. She wrote about herself, because Eloise Greenfield didn't take no stuff and wasn't scared of nothing neither. Didn't come in this world to be no slave and didn't stay one either. She, she was just who she was. And um, they had to redo the book because they, they said to save children. And she had written to save black children. These backstories are everything, right? Yes. I mean, when you hear that as an educator, what does that mean to you as you are helping young students to become writers? It means everything. You know, it, it, it's amazing how in America we're afraid to love ourselves. It's almost like we think it's anti-Christian or anti-spiritual to say that we love ourselves. It doesn't mean that we don't love humanity, but the love begins with loving us. And you do that with your illustrations, you know, and you did that in this movie. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying not to get emotional, but it Aww. is an emotional moment. But when you speak, when you were speaking in the film and Angela Davis was behind you, oh. oh, that spoke to my entire soul. When you talked about your father leaving Mississippi oh. with his friends hanging from the trees, all of us have stories like that. All of us have horror stories like that. So it means everything to me when we are brave enough to do the simplest thing, love ourselves. And your pictures do that. <laughs> I just wanted to, that is great, deserves a hand. I also wanted to comment on a significant moment in my life as a man interviewing uh, Miss Eloise Greenfield. And when we were setting her up and her mic had slipped and I asked Eloise, would she mind if I adjust her mic? And Jan whispered and called me over, and she said, 
that's Miss Eloise. Miss <laughs> Green. Miss Miss Greenfield. <laughs> and I looked at it and I, and I got it. We have to respect ourselves. We have to show respect. We have to show honor. And as humble as you think you can be, sometimes you miss the mark. And it's great to have a friend like Jan to put me back on my, my mark. But I appreciate it. And you would have, uh, uh, Dolores Jordan, Ms. Jordan, corrected me instantly when I, she, she said Jan, and I said Dolores. I wasn't from the South in Chicago. We had no rules. <laughs> uh, we didn't learn the respect that the Southern people had. So when she said Jan, I said Dolores, and she said, my name is Ms. Jordan because I, she's older than me. And, and everybody, if you are two years older, I'm Miss Jordan. Unless I give you permission to call me Dolores. So I learned from them, like I said, from Eloise, it was just clear. Every day, she, she never broke the rules, so I couldn't assume you can break them. Mm -hmm. I want to transition to the point that you made when you said genocide. Yes. Because we know that in 2023, we've had more books banned in this country than we've ever had. It feels eerie to even say that. But I would love for each of us on this panel to, to talk just a little bit about that. Um, you know, in, in academia, I publish things that most people don't even have access to. So I, I don't really, and I'm fighting against that, right, as a black scholar um, to, to get out of the, quote, ivory tower, um, to get on the ground. And so I wanna hear from all of you um, to, to just hear what you have to say about where we go from here um, with regard to this attempted genocide and the attempt to nullify and erase our stories. Well, so there is probably not a topic that is more um, infuriating. It's one of the most infuriating topics to me and I've been writing a lot about this. I'm, I'm blessed to teach at Morehouse College. <clears throat> so we don't have to apologize. We don't have to sort of like justify it in the curriculum. We start from ourselves at the center, not from the margins. Um, and I taught at Ohio State before I moved to Atlanta and jumped ship to a historically black college. So it was very different experience to say the least. So recently there are a couple essays I did. One was about banned books. And it was about um, what is being destroyed when you deprive children of children's literature and young adult literature. This body of literature that made me as a young child. And I was reading everything from Judy Bloom to Mildred Taylor to by the time I was 14, books like The Grapes of Wrath, I don't know. The point is I read everything, everything. And the teachers and the mentors who played a role in that story, because teachers, some of my teachers were readers and they loved the child that loved reading. So they opened up their personal libraries at times. There were books like books by Alice Walker that my high school teacher gave me. She would probably get in trouble now. You understand. And she introduced me to Alice Walker and the like. It was not being assigned to school, in school even then. So this dangerous period, and they've always been, I mean, let's not, they've always been banning books. Books have always been being banned. But this heightened era, because it's a social media, digital media era, and because we really haven't seen anything like the right wing attack mm -hmm. on knowledge and identity at the level of legal policy for quite some time. This is very, very serious. Parents have got to be soldiers and warriors, yeah. That's right. arming their homes and helping support teachers in their, and, and on these school boards and these PTA meetings. You have got to forge a counter attack. You have got to be the deciding figures pushing back on the erasure of books and the narrowing of what we can read in schools. You have to have generous libraries at home. 
that you're sharing with, with children you know aren't even getting those books and don't have that same kind of literacy at home. You have to do that. But we also, this gets back to the to same thing. Our voting is even connected to what we can read. Right. Do we understand this? Yeah. Our voting is connected literally to what your child can read in the fourth grade, the seventh grade, the eighth grade, or not. So when we say we must vote, policies are down to the level of what your child would be able to read. They won't be able to read the autobiography of Malcolm X. How are you going to read the narrative of Frederick Douglass when it's bound to make you uncomfortable? Because guess what? Slavery was uncomfortable. <laughs> so as you can see, I'm really, <laughs> <laughs> it destroys me, um, this situation with, um, with banned books. But we're all warriors in this room against that attack. And nobody cared what we felt as, 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 you know, as, as black children. We had to see the N-word in our books. Nobody cared how we felt. Nobody cared when, because we moved, my father was a pastor, so we moved every year. I went to eight different schools from first grade to eighth grade. And we were always integrating. And we were integrating as a mob because there was that many of us. And nobody cared what we thought. Nobody cared what the teacher up there said um, about, you know, the other N-word, nappy, hair, and all that. Nobody cared. The, so when someone says this child is uncomfortable about history, that wasn't history, that was just nasty. Mm -hmm. History, like you said, happened, it's yeah. for real. Mm -hmm. But when our teachers were just racist, that, that, that was uncalled for, it didn't have to happen. Mm -hmm. But nobody cared and they went and found books specifically that were offensive mm -hmm. and they didn't care. So it, it, it's very disturbing to me. Why, and, and I didn't know, I was a professor and I was so, I taught teachers and I was so careful because I, I, I thought they're gonna come and handcuff me if I say, don't, you know, I don't want children to read this book. So I used to even say to white teachers, if you really wanna show that book to your, don't show that book to black children. I would, don't, don't sit in a classroom with that one black kid who won't look at me. He's sitting in the classroom because he doesn't wanna identify with the black person because when you leave, they're gonna get me. Don't bring that book in and, and read that in front of those children. And I'm talking to teachers. And then now, I don't get it. Where's the law? You know, where's the quote constitution? Now, I just don't get it. I, they scared me to death. Well, I, I really agree with Dr. Stephanie Dunn that's you, right? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny that you said the thing about voting because it was in my brain. You know, uh, we have to vote. And there's so many people in our community that just don't think voting makes that much of a difference. You know, that's still really true in the black community where people don't think it makes that much of a difference. We at least have to get involved in voting on the local level. Who's on your school board? You know, anybody can be on a school board. You don't have to be educated. You don't have to like children. You don't have to know anything about anything. We have to get more involved, you know? And then parents that are in public school, we have to make sure they see us all the time. And if you're working, and I know some parents work two jobs, they have to hear your voice on the phone or on messages saying that we demand that you teach these things. Then um, Dr. Gilchrist, do you mind if I call you Dr. Jan? I would love you to call me Jan. Okay. You, I do want to call you Dr. Jan. You, you worked really hard to get that doctorate. Okay. I, can. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know you worked really hard to get that doctorate. You said something about the Obama movie. And I love seeing your film twice because I saw it at home. And then I saw it again today. And it moved me more deeply the second time. And what you said is they didn't publish the Obama book. No which is insane, so you all published it. And my head was all blown up because I was getting published because 
I was just scratching on paper and they were publishing me. Yeah, because you're and Dr. So, Jan, so, you're so, Dr. So, Jan right. you know, Chris. Yeah, I, I, so, of course they were publishing you, yeah. except for the racism. As soon as that manuscript went out, it just never. Nobody went. picked it up. And then I'm like, oh, brought back down to earth. You ain't so much. <laughs> and, and so then I. I you think, are so much. They just don't see Obama. us. And we have to be clear about that. Oh. You know what I mean? And we have to yeah. publish ourselves. Publish yourself. Yeah. You know, and we have to build our own schools. Yeah. Oh my. We have to stop relying on other people right. to take care of our children. Because they're not. It's not in their interest. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There would yeah. be no Langston and Hughes or any of those people. They had to just do it. Just do it. And, yeah. and so no, with the, my husband and I and my son, my son did the layout, the, the graphics. Uh, that little girl is the is my granddaughter who modeled. Yes. Um, the uh, anything technical I didn't do. So I asked my son, "Can you make this popcorn pop?" Because we, I owned him, so I couldn't make my publisher do stuff. But I could sit my son there and say, "Can you make this popcorn pop?" And so he, he, he I said, "I don't want the words to pop." I could ask him to do things. So he he was he did. We did that book ourselves. Yes. Yes. Then they, you know. Child is self determination. Yes. We have absolutely. to tap into that power. Absolutely. absolutely. I do want to say, too, from the other side of it, this is the first time as someone, uh, I started children's books in 96, and you get to the point now you almost have to self censor yourself because you have to understand how the schools, how the editors, how everyone's going to take your art. Before you used to just do a book, you had to go and do the story. Like as the illustrator, you had to make sure you found out how people dressed, how the person looked, what, what any aspect, the environment, the emotions, you had to be accurate. And a lot of times, I've, I've, I've done one book where I had to, the, the publishing company had to go back and find a professor in South Carolina to answer my questions because it was about a man named Philip Reed. And we talk a lot about the Capitol, but a lot of people don't know that a person of color helped build that statue that's sitting on the Capitol today. And the book is about that. Um, all right, for instance, I, I just did a book on Sister Rosetta Tharp. And if people don't know her, she's almost like a, like a rock and roll grandmother, godmother, rock and roll kind of thing. She started out as a prodigy playing guitar in Cotton Plant, Arkansas. So the first spread I did was matching the words of the author, Tanya Bolden. She talked about how she was a little girl and people didn't know that she would, she would dance into the world and, and make this mark as this little girl. So I did a painting of some people in a cotton field. I, I did the research on how long the cotton, the bag to put the cotton is in and I, and I put that across the spread and I had a man dancing with the baby which was Sister Rosetta Tharp, his little baby. The publisher pushed back on me and told me that the baby looks too happy. They said that you gotta do, make it a serious baby because people are gonna say it's happy slaves. And I had to give them a lesson on peonism and, and after reconstruction, during the time of reconstruction people got out and basically were never got out of, in, out of servitude because they were enslaved, but they ended up working, some people ended up working on the same places. Mm -hmm. And every time they went to get paid, they were told, we gave you board, we gave you food, so you have to work another year on this plantation. So it was, it was like slavery by another name, something like that. But how many times have, have you heard somebody say, we were poor, but we didn't know we were poor? And that's what I was thinking when I did an illustration. I was thinking that if it's a, about music and dancing, but still surviving, there's going to be a snapshot of, of something that's happy. And I didn't want to open up the book with, with the downtrodden people and uh, we don't have anything because I don't, I know people in, in places even today, they don't have a lot, but they have each other. And I wanted to capture that as because you were working, I'm doing something for a child. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I, I'm sure people are, are tired to see themselves always at the bottom or not as a hero or not happy. 
how many people take pictures angry. It's like I, when I do children's books, that's the importance of it. I'm, I'm creating imagery that's going to help people see themselves in a different light. But I can tell you this, reading is down. The children are not, they do not know how to read. When they, when they test them, they're, they're doing very poorly. So it, it, that is madness. You're banning books and, and reading is down. So, so everything is backwards. They're telling you eat sugar to be healthy. Eat, like everything is, <laughs> is just the opposite of what you know to be common sense. So you have to rely on yourself. And the answer to all of this is a home library <laughs> and use your social media to promote books mm -hmm. yeah. and promote black businesses. Keep the money in your community. The answer is with you and, and with us. It's a community. You just have to promote positive things. And I think that will help because I've been to many book fairs where they're giving away books and it's not the same as if somebody's giving away a free video game. It's like you can't open the doors so many people trying to get in. You have to, it's a choice now to read because you, you have video games, you have, you have all different things, all these different distractions, but you have to choose to read. And if you have a child, let them see you reading because how are they going to read if they don't see you doing it? Yeah, so many competing demands. You're right. Yeah. Were you going to add to that? I did, but I, I, thought, I thought you yeah. wanted to add. Um, just as an educator, um, and I, um, I'm fortunate to be able to teach at a private so-called Bible-based school, but we still have to, um, I have to fiercely teach, just like she's fiercely drawing, because I see the need, and as he's saying, the children are coming into the first grade not knowing how to read, and it does go back to the parents, it goes back to your home life. And many times our parents are busy working and that element of that home schooling that needs to start early in the life to prepare the children so when they do enter into the kindergarten, you know, it needs to start preschool. And that builds the foundation so when they come, you're not, you know, laboring trying to get the child where they need to be. And so even with them trying to ban the books and everything, it puts even a greater responsibility on the parents to do their job, to start early, and as he said, read with your children, let them see you reading, let them experience the joy of reading because knowledge is power, and when we all understand our role and responsibility, we don't think it's just the educator's responsibility to get our children where they need to be. We know that we have to stop and take time and do our part, even if it's 30 minutes per night. I emphasize to the parents all the time, I have to partner with you. I have to make sure you're doing um, something that's going to help me to help your child, because otherwise it will affect us greatly while they are trying to stifle our children, we don't have to allow that to happen. We're just gonna have to step up our game. We're gonna have to be fierce with the way that we impart knowledge into our children and truth into our children because what they say is truth is not our truth. They've given us a watered down truth and now we have to bring forth the real truth of what we know is true and not be afraid to help our children stand in that truth and know that you don't have to, um, you know, be ashamed of what you know is true. And everybody's truth may not be exactly the same, but I tell you what, on my um, journey to finding the truth, when I did, I grabbed hold to it and I wanted to teach every child that you are someone, you are a chosen generation, you are a holy nation and you have to stand up and be counted and be the light, be the salt, be the example, not this buffoonery stuff, be that example. And so fierceness is what we need to have, boldness is what we need to have, and that will be the lifter of all of our souls when we see our children walking in the truth. And that truth needs to be pushed at home and at our schools, and I know it's a fine line when you're in the public school, so again, I, I'm really grateful that I'm at an academy where I have a canvas where I can teach and I can impart and 
um, allow the spirit just to move freely so that these children are coming up with that boldness that they need in this society that we're in. And so we all have to do our part. So I would just say this last thing, parents, my fellow warriors, if you parents, you know what I mean, because you have to be a warrior 24 seven is what I have discovered. And I am the mom of a ninth grader, so just entered high school. This is me this morning. He comes in and you know, he's a sporty. So college football season is like his favorite season, basketball, the whole thing. So it's like downstairs, you know, they got the pregame on, they got the whole thing. This is me this morning, if this is him. I'm going down to eat because at 9 a.m., so I, did you do your reading? Oh, can I do it after, did you do your reading? Well, can I do it later on before, did you do your reading? I'm like, if you don't have time to do 30 minutes of reading the book that, you, that I just got you, that you like, by the way, then you don't have time to go downstairs and watch TV, and, but no, you don't. When he says, you know, they re I read at school, that has nothing to do with reading at home. That has absolutely zero to do with reading at home. I'm like, we are readers. It is not a punishment. It is not a chore. It is like breathing, eating, what have you. And we've been doing that since he was small. Because what I understand is we stop reading and making our children read because we think they're older and so they know how to read on their own. And then for some reason we assume they're just gonna keep on reading if we're not on their behind to say, no, 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 you, you don't go a whole week and you haven't read even 30 minutes. That can, yes, it can include the Bible, the Quran, the, they might be reading out, but they must read. And that is our job. That is not the school's job first. It's our job first. So that's a question you can answer every week. Did, what, how much did my child read this week at home? That's good. That's good. That is. That's a great note. Dr. Jan Spivey Gilchrist, can you lead us out? One final word, one final thought. Thank you guys. <laughs> my son is going to turn 40 March 3rd. He's my baby. My daughter is 51. My son has lived in Asia um, for the last, well, he graduated from college in 2006. Boy, he's, all, he's getting really old. He's getting old. Uh, but he has had, I don't know if you saw in the film, I have been reading to him since he could stand up. As a matter of fact, Elo, the book, William and the Good Old Days, Eloise Greenfield flew to Chicago, sat him down when he was four, because she told me, I met that old man, that's your son, because they would discuss the world, he and Eloise. He had no clue that he was talking to what he, you know, who he was talking to, because she was just that gentle. But she flew to um, Chicago when my mother died because William was confused and I couldn't handle it. You know, I was, I'm, I'm a spoiler. My kids, I can't, I spoil my daughter, I spoil my son. But what I call spoiled is I gave them what they needed and a lot of what they wanted too. And that's, but in, in that, I made sure that they understood where this stuff comes from. But William owns, uh, he lives in Singapore. Google re came for him and recruited him because he spoke fluent Mandarin and he was a six foot three dark skinned black man and they heard about him. Because when he was little he said, I, he made the utmost mistake of telling uh, Dr. Margaret Burroughs that he wanted to be Chinese. <laughs> she, she was, Oh no, we gotta fix this boy, she said. And I said, well, how I chose to fix him was, he was interested in the Asian culture. He just fascinated him. And I, and I had told him when he was little, and both of my kids, you can be whatever you wanna be. So now, Dr. Burroughs, who is telling me something, because I told you Eloise Greenfield was 20 years my senior. She was never just a girlfriend. She was 20 years my senior. She earned those years. So here's Dr. Margaret Burroughs, 
was even older, telling me, that little boy, you're going to have to fix, because he can't want to be Chinese. And I, so I said to him, if you're going to be Chinese, you're going to have to learn everything about the Chinese culture. You're going to have to speak the language. You're going to have, so what he did, we figured out real soon that he was never going to be Chinese, but that he really, really meant, I like the culture. I want to know about it and all the other cultures. So what he did was he became a student ambassador at 12, I'm cutting this short, at 12 years old, he tra traveled all over the world as a student ambassador. I allowed him, like my, my son allowed him to tear, my husband allowed him to tear up computers. That's how he learned the computers. So he had to tear up China to learn Chinese. So he learned everything about it. When he, when he went away to China, he was 12. He was in Tournament Square when China went back under, when Hong Kong went back under Chinese rule. He was there calling me from Tournament Square. And he said, I don't want to be Chinese. I just want to know everything about it. Is that okay, Mommy? And I said, you can be whatever you want. He ended up, he now owns a multi, you bet my son, multi-million dollar company in Singapore. They came after him. Google came after him. They wanted to know this big black Chinese man. <laughs> but because learning for your children, his library is huge. He didn't have to actually, like, who said that? The library is in his house. Yeah. Every book, everything, when, when, what, when they call me up about some book, I feel, you guys know the name of it. It's the, it's the Hitler book. <laughs> yes, my God. Came to the house, which meant everybody else came with him, with it. Because now we're being investigated because my son is reading this book and doing this story. Mm -hmm. Because he was learning about World War II. Well, they wanted me to, you know, beat him up. I'm thinking, I don't know. He, he, he searches for knowledge, and he goes after it, and I allow him. Mm -hmm. We have to know that our children are bigger than they are, because once he knew and learned about the world and knew he wanted to know more about it, you have to humble yourself and allow your children to, to dream. Absolutely. I'm an artist because my father allowed me to draw. My mother allows me to draw. I can't stop him once they start. We stop our children once they stop. You might have to hide, but you have to allow them to grow and be what they are. And, I, and I'm going to say something sexist, and I don't mean to sound sexist, but especially our boys, because we don't have to shut them down. They're going to shut them down. As much as, so you have to allow them to comfortably grow. And I had a daughter and a son, and both of them were allowed to do, but my son was always kind of broken down, and we didn't do it. But what I'm saying is, allow them to dream, and allow, move, and humble yourself, and maybe you don't agree with some, because I didn't agree with a whole lot my son. He, he decided to be who he wanted to be. He lives in Asia, and he's been there since for 30, 20, well, after college, he, you know, and he moved there. And I didn't agree with it, but it was his life, and I allowed him to, to dream and to grow, and he's the sweetest man, you met him, he's the sweetest man ever, but he is who he is, and we have to allow, we have to sometimes humble ourselves to our children. I have a mean daughter, she's just mean. But, but the, the, the son, she's just mean. Yeah. <laughs> a wonderful Spelman graduate, and, um, and just mean. But, yeah. but you, you, know, you have to allow them to be who they are. Anyway, so all I can say is I agree with whoever said put the library in your home, and then after that take them to get the more books and bring them back into your home. Thank you so much for all you've given us. Thank you, Dr. Chance Spivey-Gilchrist and everyone on this panel. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, audience.